looks like we are now live recording and we're Zooming. So I want to say again to everybody as a group, welcome and good morning. Uh, thank you for giving your time to the Health Equity and Access Response Team for COVID-19 in DuPage County. I'm looking around and I want to give a heads up if there is someone new on the call. I'm not seeing someone right now, but if you are, I'll ask you to introduce yourself in a couple of minutes. I want to remind you, it's a Zoom meeting. We are being live streamed to the public. Uh, so uh, the meeting is being recorded and that way all of us can stay engaged all the time. Uh, ask you to be aware of your background noises, mute yourself when not talking. But also, as this is going to be a meeting with a lot of discussion, I encourage you to keep your video on as much as possible during that discussion so that we can continue to build relationships with each other. We're no longer new. When we started this, most of us didn't know most of us. But by this time, a lot of us know a lot of us. And our relationships are getting stronger and stronger. I, I want to take 30 seconds to recap that we are the team that leverages our diversity to create new solutions so that as we respond to COVID-19, the entire community achieves optimal health and no one is disadvantaged. Number two, we extend our solutions beyond public health professionals. We want our businesses, governments, civic associations, human service providers, and others to join with healthcare to change our habits and our ways of operating so that everyone gets to have the best health possible. Fourth, and really importantly for our current life, we use data, the best relevant information available to us, disaggregated by race and ethnicity and other relevant identities to understand the harm that's happening, to make strategy, to take actions, and to measure our progress. Today, we're going to do five things. Uh, if there are new members among us, we'll welcome them, ask them to introduce themselves. Uh, number two, well, let me, let me talk about it this way. We're gonna step into three rooms that are very different. Our minds are gonna go through transitions this morning. We're gonna start in the most global and abstract room. We're gonna reflect back on the nine months that we've been together experiencing COVID and responding to it. It's a good time for us to reflect so that we can make some decisions about what's most important going forward. That's the first room. The second room is to come back into our immediate strategy, our listening in the community so that we're getting the best vaccine confidence building going and Mimi's gonna take us through a description of focus group process. And then the third room is gonna step us right back into the urgencies of today. Uh, we'll get an update from the health department regarding COVID and um, that, that will be our meeting today. So also I wanna kind of make a note. We've thought about this overarching review discussion for a number of months now. So, um, we always seem to have other ways to be diverted to very important things, to supremely important things. But I think today we're going to have a chance to do this. So um, let's let's first check to see, is there anyone who is new on the call today? Um, because we're about to enter into an interactive discussion regarding where we've been, I think I might go ahead as there are, uh, looks like 14 of us on the call. It's not a huge group today. Maybe I'll invite each of you to share your name and your affiliation and what brings you to the heart team. And that might help warm us up a little bit for the reflective discussion that we're going to have. And also, as we head into that, I want to check in with uh, Penny and Mila to see if I'll be, yes, looks like I'll be able to share my screen in a minute. Okay. So could I invite you to just do it popcorn wise? Um, Kara, if you don't mind starting as a co-convener of this group and passing to Mila and then Mila, if you don't mind popping it to someone else who would hand it to somebody else. Morning, everybody. Uh, thanks for tolerating the slightly odd tinge that I can't seem to fix. Uh, mm -hmm. Nice to see everyone on a Friday. Kara Murphy, president of the DuPage Health Coalition. And I'm here because of both personal and professional interest in this topic. 
and awareness that um, uh, health inequity uh, long present uh, is uh, acutely visible uh, through COVID and that it um, affects uh, most significantly those who are um, uh, displaced uh, or, or disadvantaged, but the truth is it affects all of us. So uh, we all have a stake in um, making it a more equitable place to live and work. Okay, my turn, Dave? Yes, please. Okay. Um, so I'm Mila Sagalas with the Health Department. My um, work at the Health Department began in our, in our dental programs. And one of my first projects there was to, um, to really get our urgent care clinic on its feet. And the purpose of that was to make sure that everyone had access to something really important, not only for pain relief, but to be able to function um, at work. And we didn't have that in DuPage County. We were really sorely lacking in resources um, in oral health. And, and that kind of grew to uh, a mobile operation with the, um, with the Smile Squad again, trying to make sure that all the kids in the county had equitable access to oral health and prevention. Um, and from there, I think that is sort of the key here in DuPage is we have a lot of resources through our network of partners and if we don't have the resources on hand, we're really good at finding them. So when all of us come together with heart and keeping equity at the forefront of that, um, I think we can really achieve great things together. So I'm thrilled to be um, working with all of you and, and learning more about um, the parts of the county that I'm not familiar with, um, not so much geographically, but the people that make it work. So thank you for all of the input over the the past several months, I've enjoyed every bit of it. And I will call on um, Glee. Sorry, you may hear in the background my puppy barking every now and then, but <laughs> uh, it's also like, I manage the medical affairs for an <laughs> we're located at Lyle. And that's really how I got in, connected into this group. But I also have you know, personal interest uh, just to know what's going on in the community. Uh, so we have become uh, vaccine providers uh -huh. and that um, is it, it's how I got into this group. Uh, but I'm, I'm really glad <laughs> to be part of this group. You get a lot of information that I can share back uh, to my corporation. And thank you. And Glee, are you able to see people on the screen? Could you pass the introduction to someone? Okay, sorry. <laughs> okay. All right. So can I call on Amy LaFosse? Sure. Thank you. Hi, good morning, everyone. My name is Amy LaFosse. I am with Catholic Charities, Diocese of Joliet, out of our DuPage County office. Um, my, I'm not sure how, I, I imagine everyone knows Catholic Charities, but in case you don't, we have a homeless shelter called Hope House, which is located in Villa Park. Um, we also have services for people who are low income and who are homeless, um, ranging from helping with rental assistance to emergency basic needs assistance, all the way to rapid rehousing, transitional housing, um, and permanent supportive housing. So uh, my interest in being a part of this group is really, we just have such a high, high vaccine hesitancy rate right now at our shelter locations. We have been operating a hybrid model at our physical shelter as well as a hotel for um, a year now. And um, it's really preventing us from going back fully to our physical shelter um, since we have very few people who have been vaccinated and who want to be vaccinated. So, um, it, you know, my interest is just hearing more about how we can help change that and how we can make sure that everyone has access to vaccinations. And um, I'm going to call on Laura, who used to be with Catholic Charities. <laughs> Hi, Laura. Hello, everyone. Good morning. Um, I'm Laura Morkes, and yeah, I was with Catholic Charities for uh, several meetings. Um, 
And then now I work with the Southwest Suburban Immigrant Project, which is an immigrant serving organization for Will and DuPage counties and um, the health justice manager. And so we're interested in, in like seeing the trends in our communities and also um, helping with in any way we can. And I'll um, pass it. Sorry, yeah, I was a little late, so I don't know if who pass it to someone. Know, yes, but yeah, um, Jackie. Good morning. Um, I am a College of DuPage Human Services student and intern. We've lost you, Jackie. We lost you for a while there. Jackie, you froze on us. So how about if we pass on to Reverend Miguel? Um, thank you. Good morning, everyone. Buenos dias. I'm glad to be here and I continue to um, Working with all this uh, wonderful group, the, um, where I can see the how much kind of impact in the in the community, uh, we continue looking at ways, you know, to reach and um, and uh, continue working all together. By the way, I'm sending an email to sharing uh, this coming Sunday. We're going to have a vaccine clinic in St. Marks, the three to five p.m. So I'll share the flyer to 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 add and share it to everyone. Thank you. I pass to uh, Adam. Reverend Miguel, you said Sunday? That's correct. Sunday, 3 oh, to 5 great. p.m. Okay. We, we try to catch people after the service and all. No, it's part of the- We have a Sunday. Thank wait. you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, I passed to Adam. <laughs> oh, I'm up. Okay, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm late. I just joined. Uh, so we're, we're doing introductions, I understand. Right, so, okay. right. Okay. Welcome. Cool, thank you. Uh, yeah, my name is Adam Forker. I'm from the DuPage County Health Department. Um, and I'm here, this is one of the most important things that we're doing uh, in general. I think certainly um, the pandemic and the crisis and COVID has, has driven us to, to act a little, I think with a little more urgency on um, issues that we know have been challenging our community for a long time. Uh, so um, social determinants of health and disparities uh, have, have long been a problem um, everywhere, including DuPage County. And um, yeah, I, it's really important to, to the health department and to myself personally that we, we focus on this and we do better. So that's, that's why I'm here. Thanks, Adam. And we're doing this past the baton style. So I'm going to go ahead and do a baton pass for you because now I am seeing new people coming in. And uh, so here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to give a heads up to the new people that will be asking you to introduce yourselves. Tell us about where you're coming from and why it's important for you to be here. And uh, we'll give you a couple of minutes to get yourself in. And while you're doing that, I'll pass it to Jan Guider. Um, good morning again, um, and, and David, again, I want to thank you for asking me to be a part of the HEART group. Uh, I am the CEO and president of a fledging brand new, um, I want to call it, uh, it's a nonprofit, but I'm trying to find a better name for it. It's, it's more of a drive to stamp out inequities in health. And I want to incessantly work, if I might put it that way, to eradicate health inequities from our system. Um, and I, I appreciate this health and all policies approach. Um, this is a very important uh, piece of what I do participating because I believe every voice in the community has to be valued, has to be heard, and has to be responded to. So um, any way I can facilitate that, I'm learning 
that, and, and I'm hoping we're all continually to learning um, that health inequities impact not just the lives of African-Americans, but uh, as we will discuss later, those members of our MENA community, uh, uh, our Hispanic Latinx community, uh, our elderly, one of the things that, one of the many things that we have learned through COVID is that health disparities made various populations more susceptible to increase mortality and morbidity. And if we can work ourselves in a collective group here to stamp out inequities in our healthcare system, I think we will have a much better society. And from that, I will pass it on to Julieta. Thank you, TNS. Yes, my name is Julieta. I am from Immigrant Solidarity DuPage. I work with Cristobal, Gabby, and uh, Rafa. And we've been very busy um, bringing out the vaccine clinics to places. And we've been working with CARA too, with uh, Access DuPage. Um, this coming Saturday, we're working together at St. Andrew's Lutheran Church in West Chicago, that's my town. And, um, <laughs> sorry, but uh, yeah, we've been working very hard and um, recently we got approved for um, July 31st from FEMA, um, Sandy's Bakery in Warrenville. We're going to be out there and uh, if you someone asked me to ask you, Kara, if you'll help us out with that too. So um, that would be great. And then... Um, We've also been working hard on um, personally with uh, people trying to evict our tenants. I have a, uh, I am in contact with a lawyer that helps me out. Um, no, he doesn't charge people or anything. We go on the phone, we explain to people what they have to do, the forms they need to fill out. And uh, I actually walked Sometimes I walk people through on the phone because the landlord's banging on the phone and very mad and trying to I, them and stuff like that. So it, it's been, it's been, we've been very busy with that. And recently Cristobal has called to our attention that we need to, we're going to start to elaborate letters, make letters for uh, the companies like NICOR, ComEd, and all these people because um, they're charging a lot of fees. They're, they're being uh, also kind of harassing people. And we're saying we're going to create this letter that we send them um, asking them to, to do something because this is all COVID related. And it's it's got there's got to be something they can do, um, maybe maybe a month or a couple months um, to get off the bill because it, it, it you know if they didn't have a job because of COVID, well they're not gonna be able to pay that and if fees keep incrementing and in all this the bill is huge. So um, Julieta, Julieta, I want to encourage you. We're going to bookmark. You're taking us into exactly the place we want to go um, in our next agenda item. So I want to bookmark that maybe you can help lead us off when we get to this part about challenges uh, that we face going forward. And so I'm, right now I'm going to encourage that we that you pass on the baton for intro. Okay. All right. I'll pass it to who hasn't spoken. Amanda? Amanda? So sorry I'm late. Hello, everybody. Amanda from World Relief. Um, am I just introducing myself? Yes, tell us and maybe a, a statement about why it's important for you to be here. Oh, yes. Um, it's important to be here because I feel like um, this collaboration is so important and to hear about what is happening within our community um, and to know what the needs are and to share and find the resources 
Um, I know our team at World Relief has found this really helpful. And so thank you, everybody. And uh, you could select somebody to pass the baton for introduction to. Oh, raise your hand if you haven't gone yet. <laughs> Thea? Good morning, everyone. Nice to see everyone. Um, I'm Thea Kachoros Flores. I'm with Access Community Health Network. We have a, a few um, community health centers in DuPage County. Um, you know, um, you know, like everyone, we've been kind of involved with um, COVID response um, since over a year ago now, um, both um, testing um, and now vaccine efforts. And I think what's to me like kind of important is that, I mean, this work isn't done, right? I mean, we know that there's still a lot of people that are not vaccinated, but even more importantly, just making sure people are getting, continuing to get access to the healthcare they need and that we're, we're addressing um, additional needs to get them into healthcare. So the grief right now, but yes, yeah, still lots of challenges to talk about. Thanks, Thea. You know, I might go ahead because by now we're having folks layer in and I have a list here of who's not been. So I'm going to go ahead and just invite um, Aisha to introduce herself. Hi, I'm Aisha. I'm the consultant here at the DuPage County Health Department. Um, you know, we're working, I think we're all working for the same goal, obviously, you know, to get the COVID cases uh, as low as possible and pretty much just have everyone get vaccinated. Um, so it's just a great um, opportunity to be a part of because um, I can say, you know, that I helped uh, with, you know, with this whole entire global pandemic, you know, I was able to become like even a little part of it and just in my community, being able to tackle and be, being able to tackle something so big. And I'm just excited to see where it goes and um, the outcomes and the results, uh, you know, by being here. So I'm really excited to be part of this team. Very good. Thanks, Aisha. And Sarah Thanks. Phelan, I invite you to introduce yourself. Good morning, everybody. I'm Sarah. I'm Executive Director of People Made Visible, located in West Chicago, and we are the fiscal agent for Healthy West Chicago. And I'm also the board chair of the Mexican Cultural Center DuPage, which is located here in West Chicago. Um, equity is a huge issue in our community, and especially when it comes to healthcare access during non-pandemic times, which was clearly escalated during the pandemic. Um, and just really happy to be part of this discussion that's happening countywide, which is really important. Very good. Thank you. And I invite Sue Tellez. Uh, good morning. My name is Sue Tellez. I work with Solidarity to Page Le Julieta. And, you know, like everyone is saying, we are all here for the same purpose. Um, I, within the group, what I've been doing is informing the communities. Uh, most of our community speaks Spanish. And so I've been using the information that is on the CDC and making short summaries and just encouraging people to get vaccinated. So, you know, that is very important for us. A lot of people are still scared, not sure. So we're trying to, you know, bring some calm and give them more information. And uh, like somebody else said, I am here because of that. And also because I'd like to learn what other resources are out there so we can help these people that may not, you know, they, they don't express what they need and we're trying, we're guessing what is it that they need and try to bring it to them. But I feel like maybe we need um, to share more of the resources out there. Thank you. Thanks, Sue. And we welcome a newcomer, Nancy Romanchek. Welcome. Hi, uh, my name is Nancy Romanchek. I am, uh, I have my master's in public health and I've been a nurse for more than 30 years. I started my one my own 5013C to place faith community nurses in mosques, which is a new concept for the Muslim community. Uh, and um, as I started that project, COVID hit. So all of my attention shifted immediately to COVID. I have had the privilege to work with some of you in the past, which was really good experiences and to be able to network and get out in there, out in the community to take care of the immediate needs. And that's been helping to get the word out about what faith community nurses can do in more, more localized communities to address the unique needs of each mosque community because each community is like going into a different country. 
So you really need a nurse in there who understands both the culture, the race, and the religion to really understand their worldview, to reach those marginalized pockets who uh, really stay in their comfort zone and, uh, and have a lot of, there's a lot of fear mongering through misinformation. So I am so happy that, um, that Mimi thought of me to invite me into this project. I primarily have been focusing in Lake County and Cook County. So stepping into DuPage is new for me, but I did work with um, the Pi Project in graduate school. I don't know if any of you have heard them, but they're doing incredible work. So I am really hoping that I'll be able to be of help in some way uh, to reach those communities. My, my main interest is the Muslim community, but you can't separate a community from their neighborhood. So sometimes, you know, you have to really involve the whole neighborhood to impact change. So thank you for, uh, for the invitation. I look forward to working with you. Thanks, Nancy. And, um, you know, um, there is the woman behind the YouTube screen, Penny. And Penny, have you, are you still with us? She may have dropped I am. off. I'm still oh, there here. you are. Okay, there you are. <laughs> um, so you want me to do an introduction? Well, I yes. just serve just serve more or less as support for all of you so that you are able to access this very pertinent information in your community. So thank you. Thanks, Penny. And, and I, as I've been tracking folks on the call, it looks like we may have lost Fatima. Are you still with us? And I'm not seeing you. Uh, I hope you'll be able to return, and if so, we'll bring her in for an introduction. Is there anyone else who's not introduced themselves? Oh, Mimi, of course. Oh, Thank David. you. Oh, okay. Forgive me. <laughs> Forgive me. That's okay. No worries. I'll keep it quick because I know there's a lot of folks on the line today. Um, my name is Mimi Dahl with Kandeo Consulting, and um, really my interests are similar to what a lot of the rest of you have expressed, um, looking at social determinants of health, looking at uh, communities that have been highly impacted and the reasons for that by COVID as well as other health issues, and how we can address some of the gaps in our health infrastructure to fix those problems, both for COVID and um, other health issues moving forward. Um, and I really firmly believe that it's through partnerships like this that we will be the strongest at doing that. So I'm really excited to be a part of this. Thanks, Mimi. Anyone else that has not yet introduced? Oh, thanks so much for doing that. In a way, uh, that did kind of begin the discussion that we're about to have about what's the value that this team brings and what are the challenges and, and opportunities for us moving forward. Um, it, the way that I'd like to introduce this is to uh, share my screen and see if I can bring up um, a document up that might um, add to the, as we've been talking over the last few minutes, it's been reminding us of the value as people have kind of woven into the uh, heart team, the value that's been brought. I also did a little bit of a brainstorming list and I wanna encourage all of you right now to take a minute to think from your perspective, whether this is your first meeting and the value has been to bring your attention to a new resource or whether this is your 15th meeting and the value has been getting totally reintegrated into community vaccination, um, I want you to think about what's the value that's been brought to you. And if you don't mind, I'm just gonna open up that question to the group and ask um, what, what's happened good for you and your constituents uh, because of heart. David, okay, I, I will start. Um, as I look through this bullet list, um, a place to learn from other leaders and communities so that my community and constituents can be stronger. Um, as I uh, spoke earlier, this cannot be fixing or mitigating health inequities cannot be about one group uh, because there are marginalized populations. And I think there is strength in learning from each other how this health gap 
impacts those marginalized communities. But we know too, that it's not just the marginalized communities that feel the impact because um, as we've learned over the years and specifically now with the economic cost of, of COVID is that all of us feel the impact of health disparities. And, and I think to have this kind of collaborative effort reinforces what we all need to engage in, the kind of behaviors, the way we disseminate information and the way we combat disinformation uh, has made us a, a timely group and has made us a stronger group. Thanks, Jan. Um, Kara. Oh, oh, go ahead. Go ahead, Julieta. I, I'll go after. All right. Thank you, Kara. Um, I have to say that uh, being here, it's not my first. Uh, my colleague, Suha, it is her first, so I hope she she uh, shares a lot that she does, too. Um, she works a lot. Um, we, um, I find that we learn more of where we need to be and um, last time um, I left and I kept having this concern about our uh, Arabic uh, community. Um, and I want to know, um, I want to reach out. We want to help you, that community too. So that it, it, like um, our colleague just mentioned, we, it's not just about Latino. It's not just about it. We, we all need to get this vaccine. And um, one thing that I, every time I go shopping, it, it clicks on me, what, what if we can have a vaccine clinic here? And I go always to, um, I love shopping at Patel Brothers. That's like my favorite store for many things that I get there. And it has occurred to me, I could probably my next stop I go to Naperville, Hanover Park. Sometimes I go to Schaumburg if I'm in the area and uh, make that trip and, and say, you know, find a manager as I have other places and talk to them about what we do. But I did not want to take that initiative without asking the community, people in that community, would that work for them? Is that something? Um, is that a good idea for them or who do I talk to so that we can both um, collaborate to get the our Arabic community immunized, get the vaccines out there for them, so. Yeah, Ivy, this is Nancy. I'd be happy to work with you on that. I'm finding that there's there's kind of two stri of Arabs, those who are either we have cab drivers and we have doctors. And I mean that loosely. But the reason people come to this country are, are different as, as that. Some people are highly educated and they come for opportunity and the other are kind of forced here out of immigration. So there's two stri that we're struggling to meet. And often within the community, if there is a doctor in the family or in the community, they have a huge influence on educating uh, people. But actually I have a focus group today at Al Farouk, which is on the south side inside of Chicago limits to understand hesitancy in that community. And I'm, I'm not knowing right now that hesitancy is really coming from within that community. So until I find out that information, I'll know whether I need to reach them for education and uh, information, or if they may become a resource to reach out to others. So I'll know more tonight after this focus group. I'm really excited about it. But that's really the first step. And I can tell you that the UMA Center in Waukegan has this combination of population, Latinx and Arabs. And, and both have many similarities because of their struggles with immigration. So I absolutely agree with you on the two communities really are uh, when they meet and interface, they see so much that they can help each other with. So inshallah. Yeah. Yes, I, I would love to help in that, any way we can because um, you know, we all live together and we need to 
we need to put COVID behind. And the only way we're going to do this is we're all, at least most of us are vaccinated. So, um, yeah, we, I, I fully believe that once we are immunized, these variants will, will be minor. So, hopefully. These are themes we're going to touch back on as we go through this meeting. It's, you know, the neurons are popping as both of you are talking. Other folks regarding accomplishments and value? For me, uh, this is Kara. I, I, I don't know that I could place a greater value on anything than the relationships uh, that have developed for me through this process with organizations and individuals that uh, I was not working with as closely prior to heart. And, and that has really been a gift. Um, and I considered myself pretty well connected prior, but I had a lot to learn. So I uh, am grateful for that learning. I would I echo that. Oh, sorry, go, go ahead, ahead, Mimi. Go ahead, Mimi. I was just gonna say real quick, I would echo the, the relationship piece as well has been absolutely wonderful. Um, and also just the opportunity to get up-to-date information regularly to shape our efforts has been a gift as well. Yeah, I just want to, uh, the good opportunity for everyone to learn to um, uh, give you the opportunity. When we're talking about the equity, you know, we're talking about the uh, be more uh, inclusive and uh, language and acting we are having doing this in a uh, gray and uh, they're helping us to move forward, you know, to um, not only talking about the copy with them, but the future opportunities to how can we serve, you know, and reach and uh, needs in, uh, in the community. Uh, uh, so through this, it's uh, wonderful to hear, you know, the, uh, uh, and see this group, the diversity of these groups and how do you respectfully give the opportunity to everyone to expose and bring his own needs, you know, because uh, th there are a lot. So this is a wonderful, and I, I really appreciate what all this group, you know, to um, uh, this this opportunity. Dave, um, if I could just add one thing that, when I think back to how quickly um, the group came together and, and immediately got to work, DuPage is such a large county and it has such a you know, big population, but this group was able to, to kind of do a couple of things at one time, which is impressive because we were in the middle of a, you know, serious crisis, but being able to think about policy and, and where we want to go and how to correct um, system issues. And at the same time, reach down and provide PPE and testing resources and all of you making vaccine appointments with us when we were first trying to figure out um, the best way to, to make this work. Um, this group really has done several um, parts of the puzzle at the same time. And, and that's, that's just amazing to me to, to see all of your faces as you are working on the big stuff, but, um, but making it happen uh, in the communities at the same time. Um, I think so. Um... I know that we're just scratching the surface and um, but this is so good and I so appreciate that in our introductions we kind of moved into this question of value already. Now here's here's my thought where we're at in the meeting. Um, we're at about quarter till 10. So I, I think I'm going to suggest that we take the challenges and opportunities discussion and once more push that a little bit further out. Um, and Julieta, we're going to bookmark and not forget uh, what you offered up to begin that dialogue about evictions and the risks that we'll be facing as a result of that. Um, but I'm going to suggest that we um, get ourselves ready to move to the next element on our agenda, the focus groups. Before we move into that, I want to make one quick update to the group, and this is really relevant to the discussion that we've just been having. You know, at our last meeting, um, we spent a lot of time talking about data disaggregation with Arab Americans 
and Middle Eastern, North African. And we talked about how over our nine months together, we've not really had access to that data. And so we put together a work group um, to figure out what are the actions that we can take to uh, develop solutions and advocacy so that we're able to disaggregate uh, more deeply for the Middle Eastern, North uh, African and Arab American community. So since our last meeting, that work group has reached out and developed a relationship with Mira Nagaz of the Institute for Social Policy and Understanding in Washington, DC, a national organization uh, that uh, promotes Muslim identity uh, and a research organization. So they're very helpful for us there. And Madiha Tarek of Access, which is a community health and well-being service and advocacy organization in Dearborn. What they did was give us tremendous help with recommendations and work that are already underway. And um, the, the one element that I wanted to be sure to share with this group um, as we anticipate recommendations coming next week is this comment made by Madiha when she wrote back and shared with us materials. Um, she noted that in their community in Dearborn, Michigan, which is majority Arab American or MENA population, they went to the trouble of going into the American Community Survey and disaggregating the white category to look at the deeper questions that are asked in that survey so that they could distinguish Arab American identity and outcomes from white community. And the, the big deal here is there's a difference. And the other big deal is, as Nancy said, there, there are differences within the, that subgroup as well. And that's so important for us to have information about to be able to do our work. So I want you to know that we've collected the documents that you see listed by Madiha. Anybody who's interested in reviewing those, um, you're welcome. I'll send them to you. Our, our group is gonna meet next on Monday, July 26th. You're welcome to be a part of that group. We will send a note to the full heart group so that you know this is coming up, but I encourage you if you have a specific interest, drop your name in the chat and I'll be sure that you get a personalized invitation to the work group meeting. Related to that subject, I, I wanted to say there are two other things that are really important for us to be aware of. Thank you, Kara and uh, Dr. Chug for alerting us to the fact that the state of Illinois has a new advance for MENA data collection. Kara, do you mind summarizing what's happened? Well, I can, but I actually, the credit goes, Mila is the one who told me about oh, it. Oh, Mila, so thank credit you. Where credit is due. Oh my goodness, <laughs> the string, I didn't follow the string. Yeah. Uh, but but very briefly, uh, there has been the addition on the state's reporting via IDPH um, of uh, the inclusion of the category of Middle Eastern North African um, in uh, their data around um, uh, the race and ethnicity of individuals vaccinated. Now that's the good news. The bad news is, if I remember correctly, there were either 24 or 42 individuals. It was a very small N, and that is because Historically, the question had not been asked. And so therefore, I believe the individuals who are represented in that number are likely individuals who wrote in the option, not, not because the option was an inclusion. Um, so nowhere to go but up, but it is uh, even in a small way, a step forward. Very good. I love this. This is Nancy. I just have to make a comment. I went to venue and, and actually one of the courses that we talked about was how the U.S. Census did not capture the actual population anymore. They say, are you black? Are you white? Are you this? But nobody, hardly anybody, it's all of one thing or another. And my husband is from Cairo. So he's technically an African-American. And I said to him, do you think of yourself as black or white? And he looked at me and he said, I think I'm rather brown. <laughs> I'm like, well, that's not an option. You can't put brown. There's no choice of brown. You must choose. So it was really interesting. So yeah, I'm really interested in hearing uh, what they came up with. Thank you, Nancy. That's your, you went into the second announcement here. Um, in two weeks, uh, Ben U students, master's students will give us a presentation um, regarding benefiting our recovery to COVID in the community. They're gonna look at how do we advance the community of health uh, in COVID-19 recovery by valuing 
disaggregated data. And they will focus specifically on MENA and um, Asian American populations. Uh, the learnings will be relevant to all of the work that we do. But uh, this will be a great place to kind of, if you haven't gotten your head around this issue of the importance of data disaggregation, why it makes a difference in health and health planning, this will be a great um, opportunity to do that. So David, uh, did mm -hmm. I hear Nancy say, <laughs> Nancy, I'm sorry to do this to you. <laughs> did I hear Nancy say she wants to be part of our subgroup? <laughs> I'm <laughs> sure I heard that. I'm. I heard it too. And you know what? It comes You've been up. voluntold. <laughs> voluntold. Yeah, that works. They never volunteer for anything, but I just have to tell you, we also have a free clinic, and we've been struggling because the EMRs are not set up for South Asian communities. Our community is South Asian, which is Pakistani, South, you know, Asian Indian. Bengali. And so they don't fit in any categories offered. Asian is huge population, it includes the Orient and the East Orient. And you know what I mean? So to break it down on the EMR has been a struggle. So we can't even capture religion. We can't capture Muslim because it's not an option. Not only is it not an option, it's discouraged because regulations attempt to uh, prevent discrimination against Muslims. But here now, in this case, it's working against us because we can't capture Muslims because of that regulation. So it's an interesting climate in which, which to practice because we really have to figure things out on the ground. So yeah, I'm, it's really interesting. So happy to be a part of it. Good, Nancy, it's really good to have you here and to have that feedback. And I wanna invite Mimi to the microphone now and have a shift gears now. We're gonna leave uh, the the high level abstract room of thinking about the future. And we're gonna come into the immediate strategy room and uh, uh, working to build vaccine confidence. Yeah, thank you. Um, can everybody see my screen? Okay, great. Yes. Um, thank you. Yeah, we had touched on this at our last heart meeting, but I'd like to follow up in a little bit more detail and also a plea for help, to be honest. <laughs> um, we are hoping to do some focus groups that, um, excuse me, um, there we go. Um, we're hoping to do a series of focus groups that follow up on the vaccine hesitancy survey work that we had done back in March, um, really to build upon our understanding from that. Um, we know that from that survey work, there's some communities that we didn't hear as much from, or we're not as confident that um, our data told the, the full story. Um, and that was with our Black and African American, our Latinx and our Arab or Middle Eastern communities. Um, we're also considering the idea of a, somewhat of a focus on parents of younger children as the, the vaccine is reaching into younger ages. So we're, we're kind of putting a pin in that topic as well. Um, but really the primary focus looking at those top three groups I had mentioned. Um, we are hoping to ask about the topics I've listed here, diving a little deeper into hesitancy, um, looking at maybe youth specific concerns for those also who in addition to hesitancies um, might be facing barriers to getting the vaccine. Um, and then also throwing it out to folks, like what are we missing that, that we don't know yet? You know, educate us. Um, so just making some space for that as well. Um, in an ideal world, we would be speaking to folks who um, maybe are still considering the vaccine but haven't gotten the vaccine yet and really diving into a deeper understanding of what are the hesitancies they're feeling, what are the barriers they're facing, so we can build strategies that will address those issues um, and help more people get vaccinated. Um, I think the challenge that we are really going to face as we do this work, or me personally, is that if I, you know, Mimi Q public reaches out to folks, they don't, they don't know me at all, really. Um, so I am really hoping to collaborate with partners here um, to get some entree and some um, collaboration with folks um, and tell us um, who should we be reaching out to? How can we best collaborate with all of you um, to get some of that entree and to build trust within communities as we're asking to talk to folks? Um, 
about these issues because we know that these can be sensitive issues. We know we're not, our goal isn't to shame folks or to stigmatize folks. We really want to invite folks to share their perspectives so we can understand um, and build strategies to help people, you know, from a health perspective. Um, so that's, that's really kind of my personal anxiety is being able to reach into communities and collaborate with folks, especially during the summer. Folks are in and out, they're on vacation. Um, so building some of those relationships and trust so we can do these focus groups. Um, we are hoping to do them virtually from a, for a few reasons. One, from a safety standpoint, a health safety standpoint, and also it gives us a better opportunity to talk to folks from all over the county and reduce any transportation barriers that folks may be experiencing. So um, there's kind of a dual reason for that. Um, so I guess at this point, what I would really like to do is kind of open the floor and ask all of you, um, who should we be speaking with? Who should we be partnering with? And what do you all think are some of the best strategies um, to reach folks? Hey, Mimi, it's Mila. I just wanted to go back to what you said about, um, you know, ha having an objective op and a safe place for people to share their concerns because we're, and we're really trying to reach, you know, for this to be successful, we want to reach people that aren't vaccinated or, mm -hmm. you know, or change their minds and maybe now are. So, you know, the hard part here, like you said, is, is talking to those folks. And um, I feel like it's easier for us right now to, to talk and find with the folks that are sort of on the same page. So there's a, a bit of a challenge here. So that, is that what you're really getting to is how do we not only get people to participate during these, you know, vacation and summer times, but get to the folks that we just typically don't have good reach to. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, that because of the hesitancy issue and also, you know, personally, I'm not a part of all of these communities and there's folks here at the table who are. Um, so it, it would be nice to be able to collaborate and, and get some of that knowledge and, and build some of those relationships. You know, I'm tempted. Uh, Nancy, you mentioned that you're going to do a focus group tonight. Is there yes. like a, a thumbnail description of what, how did that come together for you? Yes, I'm, I'm really excited about it actually. I'm part of a, uh, I, I formed a task uh, coalition called CMAC, Chicago Muslims Against COVID. And it's part of a Hoktian uh, 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 Institute grant. So that grant's been going on since December. We just received a four month extension, yeah. So that first part was purely education and outreach. So we did a lot of the things that you're speaking of, flyers, messaging through social media, uh, and, uh, and did get a lot of word out, but we didn't have a lot of information about what the uptake was. Yeah. And so now this next part of the grant is really focusing on those relationships, relationship building. And now that COVID restrictions are opening, I'm jumping out in the field because after everybody's been online for so long to be out in person and actually reach people is where I think we're really going to turn the corner. So this first focus group, um, we're going to, I'm going to Al Farouk in the city, which is a pretty large mosque on the south side. And I'm targeting the youth because you see in the, in this community, we have many, many immigrants, first generation immigrants to this country between 2001 and, and 2010. So though, those immigrants now have, many of them have young adult children between the ages of 16 and 24 who are bicultural and bilingual. Bi bilingual. So to reach the youth has more of an impact than just reaching the youth. Through those youth, you can reach the, the parents because the parents who stay in their safety zones rely on the children for information on how to navigate this society. So I'm really excited. Um, I also find, I did a focus group at another mosque and I also find that this group is so happy that someone is listening to them. Hmm. That they have a lot to say. They're very excited to be there. I scheduled a focus group for one hour they, and then I, I was scheduled to end at the Maghrib prayer, which is sunset because that's usually when things break up. And I said, you know, if, you if you'd like to come back after prayer, I'll hang around if anybody wants to. Everybody came back, all 26 of the, of the young men and of the young women came back, talked for two and a half hours. <laughs> wow. And so that's this wonderful. Group, 
Yeah, this group to, to that, tonight, you know, um, we have, uh, thanks God, we have some grant money for remuneration. So I said to them, what would you like for, for payment? You know, I can't pay you money. I can get you pizza for tonight. So we're going to have pizza while we're talking. We're going to socially distance. But if people are not vaccinated, they need to wear a mask. And I said, you know, and would you like, what would you like to, to uh, have for remuneration? And they said, paintball, a paintball party or um, what's the other one, laser tag. So I'm like, okay, let me look into that. So I go online and I see pictures of young children and fatigues holding machine guns, which is paintball or laser tag. But I'm like, this is really that politically correct right now. Is there something else you might like to do? So they came up with go-karting. Now I hadn't heard of go-karting, but for your information, I went online. Apparently there are go-karting places that are offering team building activities, corporate events, I was so interested. I said to the faith community nurse, we should do a faith community nurse team building go-kart thing just to see what it is. So, so that's their remuneration for tonight. And, you know, you may say, well, and, you know, communities of low poverty, they need food right now. They need utilities. But, hey, they also need to have some fun. They've been sheltering in this youth group, struggling with how to go to school online. They need some safe mm -hmm. place where they can go with chaperones to, to blow out this frustration and have some fun. So I'm really excited about it. And I'll let you know how, I'll let you know how it goes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I would love to follow up Nancy and hear more about your focus groups. Sarah's uh, and Amanda have both offered up ideas about where we see hesitancy, um, Sudanese community uh, and uh, conservative Christian churches. Um, Nancy, you said something really caught my attention, and that is the motivation to speak and uh, uh, to be heard. And I wonder um, if we think about our constituents and the communities we're working in, where do we sense that um, that kind of energy? That if we tapped uh, this group, and Nancy, you've also introduced the idea that young people young adults also have that kind of energy and stance. Um, it, is yeah. that present in the communities we're working in? And uh, Julieta, I'm thinking about a discussion we had uh, with you, might've been last meeting where you talked about the vaccine hesitant people that you're in conversation with. I wonder if we could hey, think about you. who out there wants to speak up, who wants a chance to get in a group and say, this is why I feel this way. Um, I would love to take uh, participation in trying to um, uh, debunk myths and all these things that are coming up. Um, the, I honestly think that these are just um, more information out there, get out there where these people are, um, talk to them, I guess, now that we can and uh, try to convince them any way possible to do it. Um, it's, it's difficult. Um, and we had the, my uh, colleagues, I don't know if Suhe was there, uh, like last month or something. Uh, they were out in Glendale Heights. I wasn't there because I was helping another group. And um, the Cristobal said that some people from the Jehovah Witness came up and were telling them that they were, I guess, they were committing a sin and all this stuff, vaccinating all these people. So yes, this is what we, we uh, are up against, all these powerful um, I was going to say it's a conservative church, I would assume. And um, how do we get past that? How do we inform those people that honestly, honestly, I think, you know, if, if I were to have a conversation with them, well, you don't think uh, the Lord would allow vaccines to exist? You honestly, I mean, I think God's the one that 
gave these scientists the mind to make the vaccines so we can be saved from this. You don't believe you know, that? Sometimes, sometimes you have to choose your battles and I, I wouldn't ex I wouldn't uh, suggest going head to head with the Jehovah's Witness. They won't even receive yeah. blood trans. You know, it's really right. not worth it. But the problem is that they could have that negative influence on other people who are on the fence, you know? Uh, actually, I was at an in-service the other day about how to speak to people who are hesitant. And, you know, as healthcare providers, we tend to focus on educating people with the assumption when people have education that they're gonna change their mind. But it's not always that simple. And what they were suggesting was that when someone says you something, says to you something crazy, like it has a microchip in it, which I, I have, I get that. Rather than saying, rather than vet, you, you're using your reflective skills and saying, so you, so you think there's a microchip in there. Instead, you focus on the emotion and you say, it sounds like you're afraid to take the virus. I mean, afraid to take the vaccination. That way you get them talking about their fear, which you can address. You know, if, they, if, they're, if they're focusing on how to do something from a place of not intellect, but from belief, you really have to go into why they feel the way they do and what, what they're experiencing on that emotional level rather than information. You can throw a bunch of education at them and they're not gonna change their minds. And remember in the school system, there are children of families who have the right to refuse their basic immunizations to school, but they must have a letter from their physician saying they have a religious, um, you know, whatever you call that, that they don't need to get it. But as a nurse, when I talk to those families, it's not ever usually religious. It's usually they had misinformation about some study that connected vaccines with autism that was debunked years ago. So those particular mm -hmm. families, one at a time, you can reach. But it, but again, that's my suggestion, you know, and maybe, um, maybe that woman that spoke to our group of nurses might be helpful to speak to this group. She's from Advocate Aurora, and she does uh, speak exactly, particularly on this topic, how to speak to people. Uh, my concern right now is that the latest surveys are, are showing none of what we suspect, but it's purely split on political lines. So how do you talk to a Republican who has been fed a lot of lies and believes something on a political agenda? That's, that's my current question for myself, how to handle that split from a politician's okay. perspective. You know? uh, Nancy, if, if I might add to that, uh, I'm learning as we all are as we go, uh, that we absolutely cannot afford to attack the person nor can we afford to attack the religion, but we absolutely must begin in a more aggressive way to attack the dis or misinformation because I mean, that's increasingly becoming a problem. Um, so how have you, if you've done this, how have you managed that? I think a lot of the problem is that the blessings and the curses of the internet. Internet is fabulous for information, but it's also really, you know, the people take these rabbit holes and they don't even know they're going down the rabbit holes, but one click needs to another. And, and the people that are trolling, they want chaos. They want misinformation. They're very creative in figuring out how to, peop, how to get people to make the wrong clicks. So from my perspective, where I'm sitting right now, it's all about teaching people how to use your uh, critical judgment and what the heck you're looking at on the internet. You can't trust everything. I'm telling you, I have very intelligent people sending out WhatsApp messages and sending out really deceiving information that's got like a hint of truth in it that is, is designed to be deceptive. So you have to be smart to know what's what and know where you're getting your information from. So right now we're focusing on what is what are your trusted sources of information? CDC, World Health Organization, your, you know, your organization, whatever it is, but you want to tell them, you know, don't be listening to all this stuff. You don't know where it's coming from. You might think, oh, this looks really like it's legitimate, but if you don't have the critical judgment to know that that's got a hint of truth in it that's purposefully targeting you to troll you because they want you to be confused. Ask somebody who you trust and know who knows, you know, we're just trying to rein in the social media. Hey, Nancy. 
It's Neil. I just wanted to ask you, it, it often, you know, in my conversations, it seems like a lot of the concerns are rooted in fears that come from some of those sources. And the hard part, and maybe Mimi will get to some of this in the focus groups, and hopefully it will help us with our messaging. Um, have you found any successful responses um, or been able to get through those fears? Um, yeah, I, I, uh, I can't tell you we have any data. That's really a problem. I mean, all that first year, we were so focused on creating you know, messages that were linguistically correct and culturally correct and getting them out there. We never thought about the uptake. And being all virtual, we were, uh, I think we were um, preoccupied with learning the new technology. So right now, that's why this extension is to really focus on the relationships and try to try to get a two-way communication going so that we really understand, are you, are you, what, where are you in this information, you know? So yeah, we're at the same place. And, and I would open this up to everyone in the group because there is a, a growing influence here in DuPage County uh, of these conservative Christian groups uh, who are anti-vaxxers. How do we counteract that? Uh, Nancy, last Sunday I had a conversation with uh, a John uh, uh, guy from the church. He refused. Uh, he refused to get the vaccine. Parents encouraged to get vaccinated, and uh, one of them I heard from the from him it was the um, we, we just asking, "Where did you get this information? What is the, your source? What is your influence?" You know, the, um, and uh, there are many conversation in the group with the uh, um, member of the school and internet course. You know. But I, I encourage to, you know, to make sure, you know, what is the source that you get the information because the, there's a lot of misinformation and confusion. Um, as you say, put the first, the conscious, you know, what's the importance and, and why, you know, why, why doesn't you need to be doing, you know? I mean, it's hard to convince someone when the, he's got a strong idea, you know, or, or, or sense that the, the what he wants. So it's not about to to crush with, that, with the people, you know, especially religious groups, you know, we, we need to be aware that they have a strong uh, um, background in the, in the uh, basis in the scriptures, you know, that what they believe. So, uh, I mean, we don't try to change <laughs> that, you know. I mean, it's in a way, you know, to compare a different way because they believe in that. So, but bring more uh, information uh, 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 that on, on the level of conversation with people to understand what is important, you know, besides what the, the, the uh, 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 have the, some kind of argument with the, uh, about religion, you know, the, what to do, uh, um, customs, or, or, or what you don't want to, you know. This, um, I, I try to convince, but we need to have the, this, even us, you know, to be prepared how we can face the each you know, different kind of conversation with different kind of people. Because, of course, we don't have the answers. And when we got a people, you know, in, uh, and what did that happen, you know, it's amazing because you're not ready. Many, many uh, conversations like that they come for surprise, you know. So, but I, I, I'm agree, you know, it's very important to be aware and preparing, you know, when we are facing many, many, many ways of many kind of questions, of many uh, conversations in a different uh, uh, level or different sequence, you know, to we need to be uh, ready, how can we um, approach and we have can be answered, how can we help to with these groups? Um, I'm gonna enter in and say, th this is a fantastic discussion to equip ourselves uh, for navigating in this environment with all of the change that's going on. I do want to highlight a couple of things that have come up. I hope, Mimi, that I'm listening to the chat also. Um, I'm seeing this theme of uh, health navigators and family outreach workers through school districts that that may be a pathway for us uh, mm -hmm. where, where those relationships exist. We may be able to build on that. And Amanda, you've mentioned specifically Sudanese American community and a navigator at World Relief. Uh, that's thank you for that connection. And I I uh, I want to encourage others also that as you are going about your business and hearing folks, Reverend Miguel, as you mentioned, the gentleman who's uh, expressed his um, his preference that he's not going to think about what any of those folks and be prepared to say, would you like to get together with a group and share your opinion about this so that it could be better understood in the public health community? 
And I, th- I think with that, I'm going to bring us and, and oh, one other, Jan, you brought up this idea the misinformation as its own um, topic. And I do want to hold on to that where we will not be able to address that today, but that's very important for us. And I know there's been some information exchange between meetings. Perhaps we could figure out a good way to tackle that with this group in a kind of a focused discussion that would lead to a strategy. I'm gonna- May I make a really quick comment? It's super yeah. quick. Um, I will share this with Mila in hopes that she could forward it out to the group. Um, but Becky McFarland had shared screenshots, unfortunately, because it was not a recorded webinar, but it was a, a webinar that was intended to um, speak very specifically to different kinds of hesitance and the approaches that are most effective with, with each of those types of um, hesitant or reluctant individuals. And it's very practical. Um, so I, I'm, I'd love to get Nancy's uh, contact from Advocate Aurora for a live conversation mm-hmm. on this topic. But in the meantime, I will share this with the group. Um, uh, I, I think that that really is the next place where we need to focus our energy around um, uh, other strategies than just educating. So that, that also goes to the earlier discussion today about um, what are the challenges that we face? Where should we be focusing in, our, in the coming time? Uh, thanks, Kara. And thanks all for that incredibly good discussion. And it's so nice the way it feeds the entire purpose of the meeting. I do want to invite Adam now to the microphone. Adam, if you're still with us, to provide the um, COVID-19 update. Yeah. Hey, Dave, I'm, I'm here. Uh, let me, I've got just a few slides. I should be pretty quick. Um, I'll try to make sure there's some time for questions. Uh, help me here with making sure that I share my screen appropriately. Are you seeing a full slide? Yes. Okay. Um, so uh, right off the bat, just want to update everybody on how we are doing as a, a county with vaccinating our community, um, a real collective effort with all of our community partners, including this group, as well as health systems, mayors and managers, police and fire, first responders, everybody has been um, truly remarkable to work with in making this happen for our community. And you know, we're pretty proud to report that it's, it's really solid results for DuPage County so far overall. Um, we'll, we'll certainly talk about some of the disparities here in, in a few slides in, but, but the overall metric, um, shows uh, per CDC data, which we have now transitioned to really focusing on the CDC's tracking data because we've learned that it it is a more complete picture. It's capturing some of the uh, vaccinations to our residents that may happen outside of the state of Illinois or at federal sites like a a VA, for instance. Um, So with that, you can see that uh, almost 81% of our residents, 12 and older, have received at least one dose and almost 65% are fully vaccinated. Um, On that CDC website, that tracker tool, uh, publicly available, anybody can check it out. We have found that it is pretty uh, user-friendly and you can look at all the different figures, whether you wanna look at, um, you know, how well we're doing with our seniors or the the few different groups, one dose, fully vaccinated, that kind of thing. And all of this, as you can see, um, has DuPage County, we've we've been leading the Chicagoland area and the state for quite some time. Um, but we were also able to learn from the CDC that we rank in the top 2% of all U.S. counties across the country in getting eligible residents uh, vaccinated. So again, that's really a testament to everybody, everybody that I already mentioned, everybody on this call, lots of other folks that have helped make that be the case for DuPage County. Um, a new thing that we're excited about having, but we're still working with IDPH to validate the data and make it um, more meaningful and actionable. Uh, It needs a little bit of validation to make sure. This is preliminary, but we're excited about sharing it because we're finally getting somewhere and identifying the pockets within DuPage County uh, where there is the most work still to be done. Um, And this this image here um, shows the darker the shade, the higher proportion of people still left to be vaccinated. So that is the way that we understand this tool from IDPH. It's very new, very preliminary. We, we don't have full access yet even to share 
too far and used yet, um, but we're able to see by census track year, um, those darker shades are the little pockets where we're gonna know that we're gonna need to do more work. So we're hoping to dig in with IDPH, but make sure that this is solid and better understand this, whatever data validation we need to do to make that the case, we, we are working on that. Um, but it'll start to give us more of a granular sense of where within the county we need to have a precision uh, targeting of our messaging or of our outreach, of our clinics, that type of thing. So, um, you know, if we're certainly going to want your feedback when we're, when we're in a position to share this and say, does this jive with what you think is happening in that area, in that neighborhood? And, and we'll work together with you on that as this data becomes more readily available. Um, I'm going to have back-to-back -back slides here of this chart that has been presented on this call, I think every time we've gotten together, um, just to kind of show the change and, and the, the incremental progress that is being made. Um, so you can see, you know, this is a, a data set that Dr. Chug's team here at DCHD uh, digs in and manipulates a little bit to give us, you know, what are, what are some takeaways here? Um, we can see that approximately 60% of the recipients are DuPage County residents uh, because this data set is from our DuPage providers. So anybody who practices in DuPage and administers vaccine in DuPage, this is the data that they're reporting in. So 40% of the shots they give are to non-DuPage. Um, and you can see uh, that the biggest issue is still, we've got, you know, 30% of vaccine recipients uh, had race reported as unknown and approximately 60% of vaccine recipients had ethnicity reported as unknown. So there's still gaps there, uh, but we use what we have the best we can. And you can see that we're, that there's incremental progress in, in each of these areas. Um, we also still continue to see a disproportionate uptake of the vaccine in females compared to males. That was, so I'm going to the next slide. You, you'll notice the date. This was through June 29th. Now we'll just take a quick look through July 6th to see again, you know, there's more areas where there was no change in that week that was marked, but still uh, um, some areas where there's a, a tiny uptick in each of those. Um, I wanna move though to a new chart that's a little bit easier to read that Dr. Chu's team has spent assembling this because as those last two charts were based on the providers, this is really based on our residents. And so on the right-hand side, you see DuPage County residents by race, race ethnicity, um, uh, fully vaccinated by race and ethnicity. And on the left, they've developed a chart to uh, show DuPage County residents by rate ethnicity in general. So we can try to measure and, and compare and track progress in these two charts. Um, the left pie chart's not perfect, but it's better than what we have on the previous slide uh, because it's reflective of 2018 census estimates. So it's, it's significantly more current than what had been used for those, those prior slides with the providers. Um, but we've got work to do still. That's what this tells us. Uh, for our Hispanic and Latino residents, we see that 9% show vaccinated, though they represent 15% of the population. Uh, for our, our Black African American residents, we see 3% vaccinated, though they represent 5% of the population. Um, and we do see non-Hispanic Asian Pacific Islander residents at 13% vaccinated and representing 13% of the population. So um, there's, there's work to, to do there. And I think this group knows that already, but here's some of the data to, to validate that position. Um, an important footnote, there, this group talked about it earlier, the update on, on uh, Illinois Department of Public Health starting to report uh, on the Middle Eastern and North African community. So you can see that that's, that's where this is. That was added in April, they started including that. And we don't have a census you know, baseline to compare it against, unfortunately. But I think uh, Kara said it well is, you know, it's a starting point and hopefully we're, we're only looking up from here and starting to, to collect this data. And it's certainly a positive first baby step for the state to start including that. Um, moving on quickly in the interest of time, just some updates on what the health department is doing and where to get vaccinated. 
uh, we actually are moving away from a mass vaccination model and setup as um, that is not what is needed anymore, right? We need more precision outreach and hyper-local efforts. Um, we still want to assure accessibility. So although tomorrow will be our last clinic at the grounds, um, starting on Monday, anybody can walk in uh, to our main office, our main clinic, main building here in Wheat from Monday through Friday from 8.30 to 4 to get vaccinated. Um, so we will have you know, nurses on standby to give COVID vaccines for anybody that walks in starting Monday. Um, also importantly, we're really focused on our mobile efforts and bringing the vaccine to the community. Um, so the caravan is out and the community has been going out since mid to late June. And we have quite a, a list of places that we've been and we are going. I believe Mila, you emailed that out to the group last night, right? So I'd encourage everyone to take a look at that because we definitely want um, a couple things from you guys, you know, feedback on are, are we getting to the right places, suggestions on where we could go, helping us make the connection of, of bringing the van to places. Um, but you'll see in the, the PDF that, e that Mila emailed last night, um, we're, we're busy and we're getting that, that van out on almost every day um, to at least one location. Um, so it's been a lot of um, apartment complexes, grocery stores, libraries, a uh, few other miscellaneous places. We were at the, the DHS uh, Medicaid public aid office. We were at a Planet Fitness. So we're very open to bringing it to places that, um, you know, both those uh, business owners or facility operators are willing to receive us and where, um, you know, the community and, and anyone you guys think is a good idea. Um, but we definitely want to maximize that opportunity and everywhere we can in the community with that. Hey, Adam, it's Mila. I just want to stop you for one second about the van. Yeah. Um, if anyone, you know, Julieta had mentioned a grocery store, if there's any places that people have suggestions or partnerships, they can reach out um, to, to us and try to put those together with the van if they're still scheduling to be done in August. Yep. Yeah, we're, I think they're, they're booking pretty far into August already, but definitely reach out because there's always flexibility with some of that. And again, sometimes we're making two stops in the same day and it might be able to get added on depending on what it is, where it is. So yeah, please. And there's links on here that I'll drop in the chat, but the bottom one is also where if you want, you know, easiest for us is if somebody goes to our website and fills out that there's an online easy request form and says, we want to have it here. That's really how we're getting a lot of the libraries. They're logging on and saying, can you come to our, our library? Um, so that, that exists and is a quick way to do it. But as Mila said, you can reach out to any of us and we'll help shepherd that request. Um, I just have two more slides. Uh, important sort of information we want to make sure you're equipped with for, for your discussions with constituents and community members. This is a popular question right now is about booster shots. And, and right now, this certainly may change, but right now, all indications are people who are fully vaccinated do not need a booster at this time. We really want to be focused more on the unvaccinated getting vaccinated. Um, the preliminary data is really showing uh, that the vaccines are safe and effective and even against uh, the newer variants. So it's really about getting anybody who's not vaccinated, either a one dose series from J&J &J or a two dose series from Pfizer and Moderna. And let's focus on that and not be worried about boosters right now. Uh, that's, that's where we're at. Now, if that changes and the, the data and the science points us in the direction of certain groups needing boosters, we will certainly be um, you know, getting that information out as quickly as possible. And the last point for me to make today is just this uh, chart. I would call your attention to the red text. This is just a ringing as loud as I possibly can endorsement for the effectiveness of the vaccines. In all of the cases that we've seen since, the, since mid December when the vaccines became available, 99.3% of the cases are in people who are not fully vaccinated. 99.92 of the hospitalizations are in people who are not fully vaccinated and 99.98 
of the deaths are, are in people who are not fully vaccinated. Um, so these vaccines are working. We have good real world local data that now tells us that. Um, and, and we just couldn't be more fortunate for the scientific community to have delivered a vaccine that is so effective. Um, so uh, that is everything I have today. I, I did wanna call one highlight, just most of you know this, but our, um, our website does have a bunch of information. I'll try to drop that link too quickly here um, about myths and facts and how to talk about vaccines and fact sheets and videos and tools and all that kind of stuff if you still need that. So I'll drop that link here in a minute and I'm going to stop sharing and pause for any questions. Adam, this is Sue. I don't know if you can hear me. I'm sorry? Sue, can you speak up a little louder? We'll keep our ears out. I, I have a question on the last slide. Uh, the top part in the red, um, I don't know if you can go back to that slide, but but I, I know that the latest information is showing that the, most of the cases are unvaccinated people, but this one said something different on the top. I wonder if you could just clarify. Adam, did you hear that? <laughs> yeah. Um, Am I still, I'm trying to go back to the. It's got a COVID screen, but not the screen that. Um, okay, let me was. try again. Um, so wow. we are saying with this that the, that the cases, hospitalizations and deaths are among those who are not fully vaccinated. Is that. Can you see that now? I'm sorry. Yeah. So see on top, it's saying that the cases reported since 2020, 267 were fully vaccinated and they still got COVID. Oh yes, 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 yes. So I'm sorry. So I that's what the slide says. And I I was reporting out sort of the inverse, which is I was saying 99.3% yeah. of the cases are in those who were not fully vaccinated. So yes, oh. you're correct. Uh, what the text said, the text is reporting the inverse. Yeah, there there are some breakthrough cases. That the, the point there is uh, the inverse. Yes, two hundred and sixty seven breakthrough cases in seven months, um, but that only represents 07 percent of all the cases. Okay, I see. meaning the inverse is true that ninety nine point three percent of the cases are among those who are not fully vaccinated. Okay, that sounds good. Thanks. Yep. Uh, guys, can you hear me now? Yes. Oh, okay. Sorry. I think I was having internet issues. So I don't know if this was mentioned before or not, but in regards to the bands, I have a question or suggestion. Um, we had an experience with some of the bands and I don't know if it's the same or not, but the link that is used to register the people to get the vaccination, um, it's it has a lot of pages to fill and a lot of people get frustrated because we're trying to, to do this at the site. It's not done in advance. Um, we in Solidarity DuPage, we have participated on other events and the link where we have to register is not as long. It's just a matter of, you know, entering your basic information and then when you are when you go for the vaccine, there's a paper trail, you know, a form to complete there, which is better. I, I understand it may be worse for the department to have to put that into the system, but for the people it's easier. So everybody can do their own form while they're waiting to get the vaccine instead of having two people register them online. And the internet access was really bad. So I don't know if that has been um, fixed, if there's been an improvement on that. But I saw a lot of frustration from people. A lot of people just left because they couldn't wait any longer. So have you, has anybody else seen this happen at one of their you know, events and has anything been done to improve that? So I think that that was an event that some of my team was at as well. Was this the Carnicerias in Addison event that you're speaking of? Yes. 
Yeah, it, it a couple of things. That was one of the very first uh, van events. So there were definitely some glitches that were um, coming through. But the great news about that day was that there were a lot of folks to be vaccinated. And the challenge was that it was happening while people were still sort of working through some of the details. Um, one of the things that, that Sue is referencing just for context was that um, the registration component of the of it is actually quite brief. It's the that it's the registration and then the the other documents that are the consenting documents. And there was actually a little bit of a disconnect between the pandemic health navigators and the members of the van team um, in terms of what people had access to and didn't that really had a big part to play in that um, that mm, slowdown. Um, I, my experience, my team's experience subsequent to that event is that those issues have been um, overwhelmingly resolved. Okay, thank you. I was just curious if that was brought up before and if anything, I'm, I'm sure it was, you know, something was going to be done about it, wasn't just sure about it. And since Yeah, we had a follow-up meeting with the health department and we're actually going back to um, Addison uh, next week uh, to be able to try to capture any of those folks that weren't, uh, that may have uh, left during the first event. Great, thank you. Sue, thanks for bringing that back into the loop and Kara for helping us understand how quickly quality control happens. <laughs> uh, it's, it's a good news story. I, I have us now at uh, just past 1030. So I'm gonna suggest that we do close off here. I wanna say to everybody who's come on the call for all the things that you're doing in the community now, the listening, the encouraging, uh, the vaccination, uh, the um, collection of data, all that good stuff. And then to take the time to come here and share and create so, so good, so helpful. Thank you for that. We're looking to meet ag together again on August the 13th. That's four weeks from today, Friday. And we will probably do that on Friday morning, August 13th. Please hold that date. Thanks so much for your participation here today. Wonderful, wonderful. And I look forward to seeing you soon. And and uh, working with you in the community. Thank you. Have Thanks, everybody. Day. Thank you. Bye. -bye.